lot of people confused and a lot of people um, have have been uh, suffering activities uh, initiated by people in these political parties that you know as Republicans and Democrats um, relative to their properties, relative to the abrogation of their rights, relative to uh, abridgments and abrogations um, and violations against human rights, about um, uh, war acts against humanity, acts of war against humanity, um, violations against all the treaties, etc. And um, logically, uh, with most of you who have been experienced attacks on your economics in different angles, whether you have investment or whether you have business, uh, fraudulent taxation, etc. And you see people having a lot of conversation about the politics, but you uh, when talking to many of the people, you recognize that they don't know the history of the politics operating at North America in contemporary times. So we're going to give you uh, a little synopsis about the Wigamore Party. And um, also we suggest that you take notes. And in the future, we're going to uh, deal with a little bit more details in these uh, matters. And also, um, one of the things that, that I want to emphasize to you is the misconception that people have of separating the political atmosphere of North America, Central and South America of the continent, of the Maghreb, that's Morocco, the most extreme West, the North Gate, um, the Central Park, uh, where the uh, old Mexican rulership has its uh, root, and also um, with um, Iberia, which you know as Europe, and also the connections of the politics uh, to us here uh, that has um, come down to this present time that has caused much confusion. So. We, while we can't go through all of it, we'll give you notes and some things for you to research uh, in order to upgrade your consciousness on the actuality of the politics. Also, the motivations of many of the people in the secret societies who have been operating at North America and promoting their um, own sanctioned agendas of colonial operations of the hybrid European hegemony around the world. And so um, in order to understand the politics that's been operating here, you must have a broader concept of the actual parties that have been deceptive, deceptively operating at North America, i.e. the Wigamores. Now, for one to be more properly, to more properly comprehend the complexities and the deceptive nature of the political parties operating at North America, and under the United States political jurisdiction in these contemporary times, one must have some knowledge about the Wigamore Party. The misinformed people among us are most familiar with the two monopoly protected parties, symbolized by an elephant for the Republicans, which is the Republican Party, and symbolized by a donkey for the Democrats, which is the Democratic Party. Now, these are controlled political schism parties veiled in historical and political deception. While there are other political parties operating at North America, these are not the focus of this treatise, as they have been almost completely excluded from real or actual effective participation via de facto structures, engineered schisms, and the obviously entrenched and anti-constitutional corruption. In context with and in association with the operations of the Wigamores at North America, all neophytes and scholars may and should review the associated political connections to the Napoleonic Wars. Now, these wars spanned the years 1803 to 1815. Also, as a backdrop on the political atmosphere, and influences at North America, 
and the occupational colonization operations, etc., influenced via Unum Sanctum, review the frauds surrounding the misrepresented and so-called Louisiana Purchase and the wars against the Aboriginal Moors, our Moroccans, the true natural people of the land, and review the wars against the Washita, the Dugdamunya, and the ancient ones, or the ancient ones among the true heirs of the North Gate of Amexum. And now we address some points of interest concerning the Wigamores. On the fourth day of December, of 1839, the Whigs held their national convention for selecting their candidate for president. That convention was held at Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and was about a year before the general election. The leading candidates were William Henry Harrison, who was a war hero and was also the most successful of the opponents of Van Buren in the election of 1836 and had been campaigning for the Whig nomination since that time. Another candidate was General Winfield Scott, who was a war hero of the War of 1812, and who was also known to have been very active in skirmishes with the British in 1837 and 1838. And the third candidate was Henry Clay, who was the Whig's congressional leader and former Speaker of the House. Important notation. To place the political and social reconstruction oriented acts and concepts uh, into proper perspective, one must be aware that the practice of calling hybrid Europeans of the Paleolithic stock, quote unquote, white people, originated with the Wigamore Party and their social political activities. A Whig is a member of the Patriotic Party during the Revolutionary War period and is a supporter of the revolution. The expressive era of the Whigs party is circa 1834 to 1855 and was formed in opposition to the Democratic Party. Favoring a loose construction of the constitution and of a high protective tariff in British politics, a Whig is a member of a major political party located at Great Britain, which in general held liberal principles and favored reforms. Now, these Whigs were later called the Liberal Party. Whigs were also pertaining to or characteristic of members of a band of Scottish rebels and marched on Edinburgh in 1648. The Aboriginal Scots were and are Iberians, i.e. Moors. Because of the highly principled standards of jurisprudence expressed in the traditions and customs of the Moors, the Whigs party members donned curly wigs to imitate or to associate with those said governmental and jurisdictional traditions and customs of the Moors. And these positive law principles are loosely referred to as, quote unquote, the common law. A veiling terminology was adopted for such adaptations and is noted as Whig, W-H-I-G, plus black in parentheses, then a more. And so when you see the term black or more in history, this is where the um, connotation of black was adjusted to Moors when the word black actually means pale colors, but actually to remove the people of the land from their right of, of supremacy relative to sovereignty and the people of the land. And um, when you come into the operations of the Revolutionary War and the reconstruction of the history, much of this politics is hidden from the people. So it is being shared with you tonight so that your concepts will be more attuned with the actuality of what's going on, as well as the motives of those persons who are operating in government, in the banking systems, in the pseudo dogmatic religious orders 
all of which have been and are absolutely connected. The Whigs Party had nominated three party members as candidates for the presidency for the United States during the election of 1836. And none of these Whigs candidates were successful. However, the aspiring participants uh, did not succumb to discouragement. And in 1840, the Whigs Party nominated and supported William Henry Harrison for president with John Tyler for vice president. This time, the Whigs won the executive office. Unfortunately, William Harrison died after one month in the presidential office. Horace Greeley, and he's a very important figure that you must always keep in mind to understand the politics of today, including the, uh, Whig, uh, the uh, Republican Party, including the operations, whereas the hybrid Europeans starting at North America began calling themselves white people. Ours really, after giving support and taking part in the um, and we're going to put it in the context that um, some of you who are less uh, erudite in jurisprudence can uh, recognize and comprehend in relationship to your rights, your estates, um, your sentient being, um, and uh, also to ward off much of the dark corruption that has been placed on humanity by the by the corrupted priesthood across planet Midgard. Now, as we're talking about land, uh, for for um, for the sake of many of you who, who don't deal with jurisprudence or or not aware of jurisprudence, we're going to go to Henry Campbell Black's Law Dictionary, fourth edition of ancient and modern jurisprudence and read it. And then we'll do some analysis. But we're also going to talk about its relationship to you and how it's also been used pro or con, but mostly con contrary to your best interest as well uh, as it has been taught to you that it is and also how you you're being robbed by the priesthood so let's go to um henry campbell black's law dictionary of ancient and modern jurisprudence uh and and so when you look at um the uh contemporary world and the promotion of jurisprudence around the world, you will find that um, a major part of what is called nature's God, nature's law, or the common law of the ancient Sabian Moors um, has been promoted out into the world um, from ancient Phoenicia, or what you call Iberia, or what you call today Europe, or Europa. Um, and of course, most people aren't aware of, uh, in their geological or ge uh, uh, geological uh, instructions that um, what is now called Europe is actually Iberian Peninsula and is actually Phoenicia. So most of our people, not knowing the real history of Asia and Africa, have been mentally and politically disconnected from Iberia by virtue of the um, German, Dutch, Dutch German uh, tribes, hybrid tribes that have been purging um, Europa, i.e. Iberia, for the last um, few hundred years. And so the concepts that people have in relationship to Iberia is um, that it is uh, the homeland of the hybrid Europeans, when in fact that's not true. However, when you hear the statement um, uh, that uh, anthropologists speak of and historians and sociologists speak of when they refer to the practice of the, of the uh, German-Dutch hybrid Europeans who have been falsely called in modern times as white people, understand that white is a status, it has nothing to do with complexion. Um, their concepts are that that's the home of the hybrid Europeans not knowing 
that that's the homes of the more uh, mores dubs picks etc all of these are berber people uh, within the berber linguistic group i.e commonly known as um canaanites and moors etc so um and universally known as moors and so the jurisprudence that we're speaking of actually has root in ancient African culture of balanced justice. So we're going to read from Black's Law Dictionary, fourth edition of ancient and modern jurisprudence to give concepts, uh, clarity concepts to those who, who are not aware of jurisprudence. Land. <clears throat> land, in the most general sense, land comprehends any ground, any soil, or any earth whatsoever, as fields, as meadows, as pastures, as woods, as moors, as waters, as marsh, marshes, as furzes, and as heath. Land, in its more limited sense, land denotes the quantity and the character of the interest or estate which the tenant may own in land. And land may include any estate or interest in lands. It may be legal or equitable, and you also may reference easements or incorporal hereditaments. So incorporal hereditaments also deal with abstracts. So you can see the concepts that people have of land as they have been taught in general is has been actually limited and heavily reduced. Of course, that has its political purpose. So technically, land signifies everything which may be holden, and the term is defined as comprehending all things of a permanent and substantial nature, and even of an unsubstantial, provided they be permanent. Now, originally, the term land is used as a descriptive of the subject of ownership and not the ownership, the subject of ownership and not the ownership itself. Land includes not only the soil of earth or earth, but also things of a permanent nature, affixed thereto or found therein, whether by nature, whether as water, trees, grass, herbage, other natural and perennial products, growing crops or trees, minerals under the surface, or by the hand of man, as buildings, fixtures, fences, hedges, bridges, as well as works constructed for use of water, such as dikes, canals, etc. So you can see when you're talking about land, you're also talking about incorporal things. So you're also talking about traditions and customs of a people uh, who have been established on land and hereditaments, corporal and incorporal. So that means uh, inherited things also. So that means the abstract and the concrete. And as you all understand uh, land um, as taught to the masses in general, under the um, auspices of colonial operations under the um, um, John D. Rockefeller institutions and the Frederick T. Gates institutions, which you know in the Western Hemisphere as the General Education Board, limits the um, concept of land to the people as simply being the soil. And now you know that it's not limited to that. And so also some things that we want to mention to you so that your concepts are clear is um, the misuse of dogmatic approach to um, 
religions for the purpose of blinding people as to how land is used, how it relates to you. As an example, Yahweh, or what you call, some people say Jehovah, um, Y-H-W-H, is actually um, the elements of the um, substance of the land and the abstract, uh, essentially, earth, air, fire, and water, all things that we build things from. Now, the people are told, you, told that that is the God being uh, as an entity, uh, while those who teach it know that it actually is the elements, are the elements, earth, air, fire, and water. Um, now, and when they mention Allah, they uh, usually think the same way they look at um, Yahweh or Jehovah as the uh, creator being when actually Allah is actually the stargate or the gate of the womb or woman herself that brings